guys. Welcome back to the Kennedy Dynasty Podcast. I'm your host, Allison, and I hope you are having a great week. A couple reminders before the episode. Please remember to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or on YouTube even. I'm on YouTube now, which is super fun. So make sure you're subscribed for everything so you never miss an episode dropping. Also, please remember that I have merch and I have a recommendations Amazon site. I have a blog. I even have Patreon if you want to support me there. So check out all those links I will put in the description of this episode. Also, if you like the podcast, please rate it five stars and write a positive written review. That helps me out so much. I hope you enjoy part two of our Bay of Pigs conversation starting now. So JFK takes office and the inability... Um, to be uh, what they termed as a cold warrior, right? Kennedy wants to be a cold warrior. He wants to take he wants to take the foreign policy by the um, throat, and he wants to uh, engage with it. Why? Well, the big problem is that a lot of his other policy ideals, a part of what he calls his new frontier program, which we have, we can do. A, I didn't think about this the other day. We should do a whole episode on the new frontier. I was thinking the same thing. We should, yeah. Um, it's going to be really difficult to get these things passed through because it's, you have to go through Congress to get a lot of it done. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Kennedy had a problem coming in immediately that like, he's going to have to get to everything he wants to do in his new frontier program. He has to get done through Congress. His only real option going forward to make a big move is foreign policy. Mm-hmm. And the CIA plops on his desk. Hey, two years ago, your predecessor, Ike, approved a $13 million program and we've got it ready to go. What do you think? And that program would become the Bay of Pigs invasion. Before any of that happens, though, John F. Kennedy, of course, uh, almost immediately cuts off all ties to Cuba and engages in an embargo. Now, have you, you've heard, of course, heard the story about the cigars? I was about to say, have you heard that? Yeah. Of course, of course, right? John F. Kennedy decides to uh, put an embargo on Cuba. But before he does that, he sends one of his aides to go buy 2,500 Cuban cigars, and then he closes the... Honestly, that cracks me up. Like, I love it. Like, what a move. <laughs> what a move, right? <laughs> oh, man. I love it. And uh, so he's got this situation. He's inherited this situation. Um, and uh, his advisors are, are talking to him about it, and he's talking to them about it, and he, and he needs to appear tough. He's got to do something. Now, he can't invade Cuba on his own. He can't just send American troops to Cuba, okay? The reason is because it would be seen as an act of war, Mm -hmm. all right? And that act of war might cause World War III, which, if you didn't know, would be bad. I guessed. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) you know. I would have gotten that right on a test. (laughs) Um, Yes, But 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 the CIA says, okay, we've got this idea. We've got an incredible number of Cuban exiles living in the United States, Mm -hmm. specifically in Miami, Florida. Plenty of them are anti-Fidel Castro. They left after the revolution or during the revolution. What if we get them to invade Cuba for us? And then it wouldn't be the United States invading Cuba. It would be Cubans invading Cuba. And if somehow they were able to achieve weapons, hey, right? If somehow they were able to get some overwhelming force and they were to win, hey, who knows where that support came from? But either way, all of a sudden, bing, bang, boom, Fidel Castro is no more. And communism in our sphere is no longer in danger. And so Kennedy goes, okay, let's do it. His advisors almost immediately tell him, like, honestly... This may be too small to be effective and too large to go unnoticed. Mm -hmm. But he says, I've got to make a statement to the Soviet Union, to China, to the communist world. I've got to show them that we're not going to just let smaller countries be fall to communism under my under my presidency. And so he sends uh, the the CIA goes down to Miami and starts recruiting. They tell these Cuban exiles uh, that there's a rich Cuban ex-Cuban a guy who was under the Batista re- regime who wants to take back over Cuba and that's where the funding comes from but that like fall, like that's happening in like February March but like the Cubans there in Miami figure out pretty quickly what's going on like and start referring to their benefactor as Uncle Sam. Oh wow. So um the other pro- part of this problem 
is that uh, there's a lot of people who are sim- sympathetic to Fidel Castro. Mm-hmm. And so almost immediately, as soon as this thing starts happening, um, Fidel Castro and the Cuba and the Cuban, the communist Cuban government find out about it. Yikes. They find out about the plan. This is not going well. Mm-mm. Okay. Not this is not going, not even a little, but they have, but they do forge ahead. And they gather some 1,400 uh, ex-Cuban uh, refugees. Question. Yeah. Did Kennedy know at the time and his you know, cabinet and everybody know that they were getting word of it there or anything like that and they just pushed on the, anyway? Uh, or did the, they not really know that? They, had assu- they assumed that there was, they, they did not believe that there was a, there was a leak. That's what and I I'll tell you how, the, I'll tell you, continued. I'll tell you why they didn't, why they didn't suspect this. It, it'll come, it'll become apparent that, that Kennedy wasn't Kennedy and his advisors were not aware that the Cubans were aware of it because of what happens in a minute. Okay. Um, they get they send they get sent off to Guatemala. These guys do to train for like a month. The plan is to go as follows: these fourteen hundred troops uh, they're called they're called Brigade twenty five oh six. These fourteen hundred troops are going to basically uh, find they found this little beach mm-hmm. on the southwestern side of Cuba of the Cuban island called the Bay of Pigs. Um, and they're going to basically in, like clandestinely invade, and then they're going to make a beachhead. The United States is going to support them with air and sea power, and then they're going to uh, like go into the countryside and be able to br- like get all the people who were supporters of Batista to rise up and overtake the communist government, and then bada-bing, bada-boom, all of a sudden Cuba's capitalist again. One of the things they really want to do is to make sure that Cuba doesn't have the ability or that Castro doesn't have the ability to fight back. And so what? So the CIA, in its, all of its wisdom, decides to take two B-26 bombers from the Second World War mm-hmm. and disguise them, like by painting them. It's all just as like, da, da, da. <laughs> like, it's just like, no. So they paint, these, they paint these bombers. They paint these bombers. And, uh, and so two days before the invasion, two days before the planned invasion, they fly them to Cuba to, oh, to, Cuba to try to bomb Cuban airfields and destroy Castro's very small um, air, air force. The problem is, is that Cuba, I'm oh, sorry, not Cuba, Castro had known about the plan all along and had moved all of his planes. So the bombings do not work. That's where, that's like step one of like how this goes poorly. Step one was honestly the idea in the first place. But step two is these bombers don't, aren't, aren't able to dis, dismantle or, or undo or, or, or destroy um, Castro's Air Force. Two days later, in boats, in like fishing trawlers and little tugboats, 1,400 ex-Cub, ex, uh, or Cuban exiles travel from Nicaragua and Guatemala to the Bay of Pigs for the official invasion. It's time to overthrow Castro. And they make it to the beach. And that's like pretty much the only accomplishment that they get done. Aww. They actually get there. They sort of establish a beachhead. And everything is going as the plan except for one small problem. One, the Bay of Pigs was a pretty shitty place to actually perform this procedure because mm-hmm. it was very secluded, very remote. There was not a lot of it was a pretty long distance to the place they were planning on taking their, like, to steady, establishing their base, which is in the mountains. And also, it's, it's just not a great, it's a lot of, a lot of uh, it's not a great terrain. But the other problem is that there's like this, there's just a radio station on the beach. And they see all of this happening. And they start to broadcast to all of Cuba oh. that there are, there's an invasion. <laughs> No. <laughs> and somehow the CIA, with thirteen million dollars, which I'm pretty sure is the equivalent to like almost like two hundred and fifty million dollars today, or maybe more, they didn't see, they didn't on their plan go, hey, there's a radio station. We should probably do something about it. That's brutal. So they they're there. They're on the beach. They 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 are they are trying to engage. The one ace that they have up their sleeve is that Kennedy and, of course, the, the United States are going to provide air support for them, which is going to give them the overwhelming firepower that they need right. to forge ahead, to go forward. And, uh, but by this time, because of the radio station, the world, the ne- by the next day, the world has gotten notice of what's going on. And John F. Kennedy, the freshly minted president, doesn't 
want to basically cause World War III. So he decides to not commit America's air power to the invasion. And then Fidel Castro shows up. Pause. Do you think that that was a bad move for him not to commit America's air power? Um, purely your opinion. There's an old um, uh, hunting writer by the name of Robert Ruark. Hmm. He was called the poor man's Hemingway. He used to lead safaris in uh, Africa uh, for like rich clientele, and he would write books about it. And one of his most famous book, or one of his most famous books, is literally entitled On Hunting in the African Safari, the title of the book being Use Enough Gun. Mm. And so the issue here, and this is, by the way, how many, I mean, think about every time in your life that you have um, done something gotten scared in the middle of it and decided to quit or to pull back when you probably should have just forged ahead. Mm -hmm. um, for you, I'm going to use an analogy from college, taking a U.S. history test. <laughs> you can't just quit in the middle of it. I didn't. I forged ahead. I found and you. And exactly. You <laughs> exactly. And so um, the problem here is that Kennedy just doesn't use enough gun. And yeah, it's a, it was, if you're going to commit to it, if you're mm -hmm. going to commit to this kind of action, you can't just pff, yeah. piss out in the middle of it. Super and so... Um, if you don't agree, it's okay. It's an opinion. It's not okay, you don't continue. agree. I mean, I don't, I don't know how you can disagree <laughs> oh, with get, it. No, but. you don't understand. People get passionate. I get some DMs. Like, people, people are very passionate about the subject, which I, which I love. That's why I started it. So, yeah. Anyway, and so, so Castro shows up with 20,000 soldiers. And tanks. And actually, he decides to lead it himself. He's actually, and the, the tank that he used to repel the Bay of Pigs is sitting on a pedestal at the Museum of the Revolution. Mm -hmm. Super cool. But he was, he was there. And it's like two days of fighting. A hundred of these paramilitary forces die uh, of the 1400. They're oh, stranded terrible. on the beaches. They're out of ammunition. The guns that they had were faulty anyway. And the United States isn't providing air support. That's and so, so sad. On, by, by 19 April, they're defeated. Mm. Okay? And they take 1,200 prisoners. And it is a massive PR nightmare. It is a massive political failure, foreign, foreign affairs failure for the Kennedy administration, and a massive success for the Castro regime. The one upside to this, or not upside, but at least the thing that I think is at least redemption for Kennedy, if there is anything from this event, is that He's now, he's got, there's got these prisoners here, and he promised these people that, that the support of the United States, and he didn't give them air support when they needed it, so he very at least feels an obligation to help them, and mm -hmm. so he does begin negotiations for their return. Okay. Um, and luckily, over the, like, he's, he's back and forth, back and forth with the Castro regime. Um, at one time, they were going to do, like, 50 tractors was one of the offers, like, we'll give us back the 1,200 guys for 50 tractors. They didn't want that. Eventually, what happens is that Kennedy trades about $53 million worth of food and medicine to the Castro regime mm -hmm. for the return of the 1,200, um, 1200 exile or 1,200 paramilitary forces, Brigade 2506, as they would be called. And then, like a couple of months later, Kennedy goes down to the to Miami and meets with these guys in the uh, in in Miami, and they like they hand him a flag of the Brigade 2506, and he says like we're not gonna like we're not gonna stop. This was only the beginning. Thank you for your service. Mm -hmm. But it's his fault that it didn't happen, that it didn't work in the first place. And so uh, what happens after that, so this is now the postlude. Postlude. The postlude is that now uh, the United Kennedy and the CIA develop what's called Operation Mongoose. Mm -hmm. Okay? And of course, I'm sure I, we've talked about Operation Mongoose before. But, of course, that was the plan to, to try to kill Fidel Castro by any means necessary. The Question. most— Oh, sorry. I don't Go want ahead. to interrupt Go you. Go ahead. Um, have you read—I want to do an episode purely on, if you've read in detail about it, the amount of times and different strategies and things that <laughs> Kennedy and Bobby— and, well, those, they're both Kennedys, but you know what I mean? Uh, JFK and Bobby and— you know, a ton of other people in our government did to try to kill Fidel Castro. Yeah. Like, have you read about that? 
I've read about a couple of the methods by which they tried to. We should do an episode on that because I just think that would be crazy. I mean, they would say, like, he has a million lives. Like, he literally would dodge everything. It's ironic that you say that because of the two methods I remember, one, and this might get you guys interested in this. We can go into the science of it. One was an exploding cigar. Oh, I haven't heard that one. I heard about the, the pin. The they pin, put, yeah. there was a pin, and then there was also, like, tr- they tried to train cats <sighs> with bombs strapped to them. I mean, it's wild. Like, and he dodged every single one of them. Didn't his, like, one of his aides or something use the pin and be poisoned? Like, it's just crazy. So, I don't it's know. A, I think that's, that's a whole thing. Topic. So, so, that leads to Operation so Mongoose. And then, of course, that failure emboldens Castro, pushes him close, pushes Castro and, the, and Cuba closer to the Soviet Union, and then leads to the Cuban Missile Crisis a year later, or more than a year later. Mm-hmm. Again, massive failure for John F. Kennedy it, 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 right out the gate. One could say that naivete played a role. He had only been president for a couple of months, and he really mm-hmm. didn't really know what he was doing. Uh, hubris is another reason that you could say um, it was a plan that he wasn't fully aware of. He didn't commit enough resources to it. He didn't use enough gun. Mm-hmm. And, and so uh, if you are interested in this, uh, the, there is a book called The Brilliant Disaster, uh, that's where I that's where I got a lot of this information from, um, and 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 have done so. Th- so that's it. That's the story of the Bay of Pigs. It really isn't that long of a thing. There's not a lot of detail to it. It was yeah. There's I mean there's there's a lot of like intricacy that there was you know the different the 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 the, the, the battle that went on, but that that stuff is kind of superfluous and sure. you know it's not this. But like there's a lot more, but it really is that simple. A plan have- developed during the Eisenhower administration that was put on Kennedy's desk the day after he became president that he decided to go with, and mm-hmm. it just didn't work out in his favor. Well, I am going to get into the question segment because I have a few questions for you from listeners. Therefore, in answer to your question. Question number one. Question number one. Why was JFK blamed for the fiasco even though it was Eisenhower's plan? I'm going to say it again. Thrice I'm going to say it. <laughs> he didn't use enough gun. Yeah. He didn't commit to the pr- – he, he said, okay, and then he got scared. And he backed out. And you just, as far as foreign policy is concerned, uh, when it comes to things like this, like JFK, basically he got worried that he was going to start World War III. And so it's essentially, he got up to the point where he, where he had to commit, because he, and then he basically, I think he basically realized, I think his advisors realized, hey, we're going to need to commit a whole lot more resources to this. And if we do, we risk starting a full-on war. Yeah. And yeah. It just, it, I, I think it, it scared him. And he said, better to deal with 1,400 pissed off or 1,200 pissed off Cuban exiles than the whole communist world. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just didn't use enough gun, didn't commit to it. Mm-hmm. Once, he, it once it got started, he didn't, he didn't finish. He didn't finish it. And, of course, by the way, by the way, by the way, this won't be the first time. This is not, this is the first time that Kennedy does this. And technically, he wasn't able to finish it because he was assassinated. But just remember that the Vietnam War was a similar circumstance, except he did, except the United States did the exact opposite. Kennedy is yeah, the one who sends the first advisors over to Vietnam. And Johnson then decides to basically full-on commit to the war, not because it was winnable. It wasn't. His advisor says, this isn't winnable. Johnson does the complete opposite that Kennedy does. Johnson commits 200,000 troops to Vietnam for mm-hmm. a war that is largely to preserve America's image. Yeah. Do you think Eisenhower would have gone full force with it had it pushed while it was Eisenhower had two years and he and didn't. He just didn't. Yeah. That's what you're I think Eisenhower was a military. I mean, Eisenhower was, was the Supreme Allied commander in World War II. I think Eisenhower would have been like, he would have seen the strategic folly of it and he probably would have said no. He was like, we'll put this on Kennedy's desk <laughs> on January 19th. <laughs> like, slide yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, okay. Question number two. Do you think the BOP invasion made Kennedy become more peace-centered? No. But I think it I think it taught him a lesson. I think it taught him that like he had like I think you see the lessons he learned from the Bay of Pigs in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Once he committed to preventing the Soviets from putting missile more missiles in Cuba and establishing the blockade, he basically said if this goes to World War 3, it's going to go to World War 3. And that lesson made him a better president. Yeah. I mean, our failures are often our, our greatest learning moments, our greatest opportunities to learn. And I, and I do think that 
I do think that his, his, his failure helped him become a better president for the two more years that he was president. All right. Well, thank you so much to America's favorite history teacher, Ryan Pryor. Give him a hand. He's done his duty, and I will have him back super soon to probably do... What was that thing we just talked about we wanted to do? Operation Mongoose. Yeah. Also, no, the New no, Frontier. No, no. What, what, the New, new frontier. frontier. I'll have him back for New Frontier episodes, because that would be super fun to get into and dive into with all, the old prior. Uh, that, well, pal. the New Frontier, and actually... It, that actually is a Bobby episode. That's a that's like that's kind of that could be like four or five episodes because Bobby largely takes on the takes like as a, yeah, as a part true. of his 1968 campaign, like mm-hmm. the war on poverty. Part the big thing about the New Frontier was a war was to like to end poverty in America, and yeah. Bobby was really about that as well. And I think that would be a really cool. There, there, there's a lot there between Caroline the two of them. To join us for that too. She would be. She would be very. She she likes that a lot. That's her. That's her. Her bag for sure. I know. We need to do it. That'd be fun. All right. Thank you so much for listening, and I will talk to you guys soon. Come on and vote for Kennedy.